Welcome everybody. Welcome to Around the Corner, a series where we talk about all things APIs and business issues around APIs. And in today's episode, we welcome Micah Munson and we will talk about how to design and build great web APIs. The last time Mike and I met um, was in San Francisco and uh, that was really nice. I still remember that. Uh, the time before was in New York. That was not quite as nice because we were mostly in a hotel, but at least we were traveling. So this time is a little different. So I am sitting here in Zurich. Mike is in Kentucky, but at least we get to talk, which is really nice. So welcome, Mike. Hello. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. Like you said, I'm, I'm uh, hunkering down here in Kentucky. Uh, we're doing fine. We're just taking it as we can. I wish I could be with you the last time. We got a chance to sit outside uh, in San Francisco in the Bay Area at the bridge. Uh, here I'm just in my spare room in the house. So I'm just imagining. Yeah, absolutely. This here is I mean, nothing against my apartment, but compared to sitting at, on the Embarcadero in San Francisco, this is slightly different. <laughs> I, I, love the, uh, I love the map behind you. It's very aspirational, right? This is the Grand Canyon I see, is that right? Yeah, this is the Grand Canyon. So yeah, the question is, when will I see this next time? This also will take a little while, we'll see. Okay, so let's dive right in. So you're a really, really well-known author in the API space. You've written many different books about APIs. And um, actually, I think before this one, the, the one before this one, right, is one we wrote together, the Continuous API Management book. Is that true? Or was there even one in, in between that I kind of missed? Well, that's the, la that's the last full book-length project uh, that I worked on. It was with you and uh, uh, a couple other people. Uh, I have since then done a couple of short, uh, what are called reports at O'Reilly. So I did a report on API traffic management uh, that was released uh, uh, earlier uh, or later last year. And I actually did one on serverless that was just released in January. So I keep, I keep pretty busy. This is one, however, that I've been working on for close to a little more than a year. So I'll be really anxious to get this one done. I'm on the last chapter this week. So I'm very excited to get this one finished. Yeah, this is a long time for you. You, you usually just uh, crank out books like nobody else. So, so about this one, I'm wondering, so you, you've written many books about APIs. So what's special about this one? What's the target audience? What's, what was your motivation to start with this specific book and to, to pick these, these topics that you're, that you're um, discussing there? Yeah, so this book is a bit of a departure. This book is very much a hands-on book. Um, there are, the chapters all have even an exercise at the end to work on. So this is really a collection of my, my habits, my practices, and the, the tool chain that I use when I explore API space. So I, I write a lot of APIs as experiments. What would it be like if the C API worked this way, if the format look, worked this way, if they communicated this way, so on, stuff like that. So this is really a collection of, of what, it, what I usually go through to design and build APIs. And it's also really aimed at um, just the general API build audience. A lot of my books, especially my API focused books, are pretty opinionated on the notion of using hypermedia or links and forms in APIs as a, as a stylistic and design element. That's, I think that's really important. However, this book doesn't really emphasize that. This book doesn't depend on that. Uh, it relies on it in a, in a couple of cases, so I can show some examples, but it's not quite the same sort of opinionated version of, of what I've done before. For instance, I did a hypermedia client book. I did a book on writing hypermedia formats, right? But this one's a little, little bit wider audience. So uh, what are the processes I use? What are the tools I use? And uh, uh, how can people start to do that same sort of thing and so we hit the whole life cycle from design to build to release and beyond. Since you're mentioning that, right, that's, that's kind of the, the general setup, so to speak, of your book, right? It's this design, build, release. These are the three big sections that you have in your book. Why did you pick those three ones? What is the special significance of those three for you? Yeah, so to me, they, they mark sort of the three big chunks of API creation life cycle. You've got to have some kind of designing process. Uh, you've got to have some kind of building process. Sometimes those design and build are divorced from each other. There's lots of 
full stack developers, but there are lots of organizations where the designers are a different team or the designers are a borrowed resource or an expert resource that helps the build team. So I wanted to talk about each of these individually and, and the same goes for the uh, release phase. Um, so uh, in the release phase, a lot of times that's going to be driven by some DevOps tooling or by some other process inside a large organization. So I wanted to focus on those separately. That way, if you tend to be spending most of your time in one of these categories, mostly a designer, mostly uh, working in operations or, or mostly working in build, these other parts of the, of the story sort of uh, combine for you. So you could sort of see, we actually take an API through all of those steps. So you can see where, where they all go along the way. So I wanted to give people a chance to, to see something familiar, focus on a particular area, learn a set of skills, but also see the whole picture throughout. You also have a lot of code in the book. You even have individual exercises at the end of each chapter. So, so there's a lot of code in the book, a lot of code to go through, to use, to try out. Um, that, that looks like it was quite a bit of effort for you to go through. So why did you do it and, and what, like, how much effort was it actually? It was a lot of effort. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. That, that's one of the reasons this book took longer than I thought. Um, because as I said, I take the same project through all 14 chapters, all of the story. And then there are also multiple other parts. So one of the big lessons in the book is that often you're aggregating other APIs in order to create your API. So there are uh, five different services. There's one you build in the book. There's one that combines all of those. And there are a couple of alternate versions of some of the same ones that, that uh, change over time. So there literally are thousands of lines of code. And of course, what happens is through the course of writing this book in the last year, like real APIs, some things change. So I had to go back and, and make sure that I align things from the beginning to the end. A lot of times when you write for teaching, you, you sort of do things a little bit differently. So it just ended up taking a, a lot of effort. It's the most code work I've done in maybe, honestly, dating myself 20 years. Uh, when I was back doing a lot of books on Visual Basic and a few other things, I was writing a lot of code then. But this, this was a big challenge for me. It was very enjoyable. Uh, really, really, uh, every day I get up and I write a little bit of code. I love that, but it was a real challenge. So your design section has three chapters, model, designed, and describe. What, what, are, what is the significance of these three different chapters that you all kind of show or dis describe as part of the design process? What's, what, are, what is the difference of these three things? Right. So, um, the, the, the idea here is that you actually need to discover what the problem is. You need to talk to customers, stakeholders, whatever, and then figure out what their view of the world is. That's what the modeling is for. So I'm actually going to model this, uh, this feature request or this API request uh, based on uh, what I learn. Um, so that there's, there's stuff in there about writing an API story, which is similar to a user story and then writing what I call uh, uh, workflows or, or, or API flows, how, to, how you go from step to step to step, how people see it. So that's really the modeling part. Models are always a particular view that someone has on a situation. Um, the actual designing part is actually converting that model into something that could be an API. So uh, collecting up all of the data elements, collecting up all the action elements, figuring out what the relationship is, figuring out if there are dependencies on, on one state or another, so on and so forth. So that's actually turning that model into an electronic uh, API kind of uh, design. And then the third chapter, which is descriptions, this is a, a sort of a pattern that I picked up a long time ago. And that is that I want to describe the design in a machine readable way, but I want to do it in a way that's agnostic to a particular technology. I don't want to just uh, turn that design into an HTTP CRUD API or a GraphQL API or um, um, you know a, an eventing API or a hypermedia API. What I want to do is describe it in a general term and then let uh, build and uh, develop figure out what the actual technology is. So, so that's uh, relying on a thing called a description format or an API profile. Uh, which I, I use Alps, which is the thing that Leonard Richardson, Mark Foster, and I have been working on for a few years. So really this whole uh, build section, or this whole design section is setting up for build. It's you work on the model, you figure out how to 
turn that model into a, a coherent design, and then you figure out how to turn that design into a machine readable description that will hand off to the build staff. Okay, that, that makes sense as a process for kind of getting started with building an individual API. Before you even get started with that, you even before that, you have some chapters, and one of those is, is called API First. So API First is something that's actually very dear to my heart. So I'm wondering, why did you put that chapter in there and what exactly for you is the significance of API First and how does it fit into that picture? Yeah, so API First is kind of a meme, right? You and I have talked about this before too. Uh, it's sort of a way of thinking about uh, how you would approach the problem, how you approach APIs. I think I first uh, heard about API first from uh, Cass Thomas. This was years and years ago. And he was talking about how it's important to think about the idea that you're solving a problem. What is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the interface for that, for that, uh, for that problem, for that solution? Uh, and then establish that as your, as your guidepost first. So it's working from the outside in. Kind of approach. Um, I also like um, Ken Lane's uh, way of explaining API first. He said, before you build the app, before you build the website, build the API. Because the API becomes the sort of the foundation of the fundamental that both the website and the app and then future apps could use. So I really try to talk about these two things, this idea of having solving a problem. What's the business problem? Who are your target audience? How are you going to uh, uh, model this in a way or design this in a way to solve that? As well as using API as kind of your foundational layer as sort of your, your base pillars for whatever project you're working on. So I thought it was really important to just talk about that uh, as a general idea before getting too excited about the actual design work. So there are so many things you have to sort of start figure out where you want to start. I, I didn't do a lot of things on ethnography and interviewing and like stuff with stakeholders, but I wanted to start somewhere. So that API first was really where I decided to begin. That makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's, it's an important topic to, to add, even though you're focusing on individual APIs, but I think like talking about this mindset is a really good idea. If we look at, so to speak, at the other end of the book, um, not at the start, but at the end, um, it, it doesn't stop with deploying you also have a chapter on modifying. Right? Why did you add this chapter? One, one might think that, yeah, well, if I deploy my API, I'm kind of done. But I, I like that you have modifying in there. So what was the motivation for that? Yeah, so this, this was another uh, important decision along the way. You'd figure the, the, uh, the release section actually uh, has things on testing and securing and then uh, deploying, actually releasing into production. Um, and then you'd think it was over, but actually I added one more chapter, which like you said, is the modifying chapter. In real life, um, APIs are actually, the, the life cycle doesn't stop when it's released. It actually almost really just begins. It sort of hits a new phase. Um, so after it's released, if it's popular at all, the API actually generates uh, requests for new features. Gee, I'd really like to be able to do X, or I've just discovered I'd like to do Y. Uh, can we modify this existing feature to add another argument or so on and so forth? So this idea of modifying production APIs is a, is a big reality. Typically, people use a thing called, they call versioning, right? Which is really just forking another copy of the API. So I wanted to address that notion of what's it really like? What do you run into when it's time to do modifications? So a lot of times you've already got existing consumers, you've got existing apps uh, running somewhere, you got to make sure your modifications don't break them. How do you do that? What are the rules for actually changing the design safely? And then what are the rules for actually releasing the build safely? Those are sort of two parallel elements. So I wanted to make sure to include that story in the book as well. So after you've built your API, you've done all the designing and building and testing and securing and releasing, then I throw in this idea that somebody just asked for a new feature for your API let's make a change and make sure that it doesn't uh, break anybody along the way. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds very reasonable to me. I think that's really, if you, if you use APIs or if you build APIs and you don't think about how you are going to change them, I think you're leaving out a pretty important part of the whole picture. Another question I have for you is that you mention a lot of tooling in your book. You, you mention a lot of install tools that you can use, a lot of network-based software as a service tools that you can use. So you, you mentioned a lot of those tools. So I'm wondering why did you mention so many of those and what's the importance of these tools for the things that you describe in the book? Right, so again, 
just like the, the things we talked about before, uh, this is really a collection of my habits and my practices and what I've built up over time. So in this case, uh, I, I actually start with, I think in the first chapter, we start with curl and then we talk about Git and then we talk about, I use Node in the book. So we talk about NPM as a package manager and as, as a build tool. And then we talk about a little bit about editing and then we talk about the description formats and, and uh, uh, runtime formats. We talk about node libraries and, and all these things down the way. We talk about testing platforms like I, I use Postman. There's a chapter that focuses on Postman. I also wrote some simple uh, request testing tools with Bash. Uh, I've got some little utilities for converting Alps into uh, documentation files, how you can generate docs from OpenAPI using the Swagger Hub Editor, using uh, Apiary as a, a sketch platform. And then, as you mentioned earlier, a bunch of things that you don't install, uh, like uh, SaaS platforms for testing, that, that's Postman SaaS platforms for authentication. I use Auth0. And then even the deployment platform. So I feature Heroku in this book because I like Heroku because it's simply a git push deploy kind of experience. So I wanted people to sort of see all of those categories. Uh, you're going to need to solve the testing problem. You're going to need to solve the security problem, you're going to need to solve the editing and the build and the design and the describe and all those other steps. So it's really a way to sort of create this toolkit. This is the one that I work on every day, but also give readers a chance to understand your organization may not use Heroku. You may use Azure or uh, GCP or uh, AWS, but it's in that same category. You're going to need to deal with a deployment platform, a security platform, a testing kit, and so on and so forth. So it's a way to remind people all the, the things you need to carry along the way in that journey and then give them examples in, uh, about the ones that I end up using. So when I look at the complete, not complete, but you, you kindly had let me have a look at the draft. When, when I look at the draft that I, that I got to look at, it's already over 300 pages. So it's, it's a pretty substantial book. I'm wondering when I look at this kind of book, it's like, is there any stuff that you left out that you had to cut out where you thought, oh, that shouldn't be in there? Or do you think that that really it, it is pretty, pretty comprehensive the way you were able to write it? Yeah. So, you know, as we were talking about earlier, there are a bunch of things in the early part of the book that I had to leave out. This notion of how you actually discover what uh, somebody needs. It starts right in the book with somebody comes to you and says, we need a new API for X. Well, how did that happen? Where did that come from? What was the decision making? What are the business decisions that say, this is the API to build right now uh, to solve our business problem? So I didn't include any of that. I didn't include anything on monitoring and measuring. How do you know you're building the right thing? How do you know once it's released, it's being used and being used properly and, and taken advantage of? How do you know whether or not it's creating errors or actually contributing to a business goal? There's a whole bunch of things about you know, monitoring to manage APIs, which I don't have. Um, since it's just focusing on APIs, I also don't have anything about the ecosystem. You know, uh, One of the things I like about what you talk about, you, you talk about in the AP, continuous API book and a lot of the things you do is, APIs exist in an ecosystem of lots of other APIs and lots of other services. So that affects design and build and deploy. I didn't do, you know, I had to leave that out. And then finally, um, on sort of the backside, a thing that I really wanted to, to add but just couldn't work in uh, was this idea of um, automating dark release, automating release services. So a lot of times when you put a new feature in, you might maybe want to turn it in for, you know, turn it on just for a small group of people like your beta testers or your internal users. And there's some great tooling out there, some great platforms, some service platforms, as well as internal tooling for doing this kind of trickle out uh, release. So you can do a dark release and turn it on. So there's a whole nother chapter I, I didn't do as well. So between things like what happens before API first, what happens after uh, release with, with dark release? What happens during monitoring and measuring? There are a whole other books uh, that, that people need to find uh, or people need to write that I would love to see uh, built someday, but I just couldn't fit everything in. Like you said, I'm over 300 pages now with the solutions and there's going to be indexing and other things. So it, this, will be, this will be more than enough to keep be, people busy for a little bit. I'm, I'm sure it will be. Um, so I think it's available already, right? You, you gave me, you, you let me have access to a little preview. So I looked at it and it looked like it's not, not finished, but it's pretty well along the way. So what is available now and when are you going to release the final version and I guess start your next project? 
Yeah, so uh, this is actually going to be, uh, it's in a thing called beta release. So uh, Pragmatic Publishers has this great program where you can actually uh, listen to the, or, or watch the, 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 the book in process, so to, so to speak. So you can sign up for a beta and then I'm releasing a new chapter about every month. I'm actually on the last chapter, but I haven't released it yet. So there's still time to sign up for the beta. So you get to see the book as it's built. Uh, we'll, I'll finish the last chapter this month. We'll go through some final edits in June, some illustrations and some other things. So hopefully by the end of June or early July, it'll actually be released uh, and available. So it'll be available as a print book, as a download book from Pragmatic Publishers and on major book platforms. So if you've got uh, Safari Online, for example, it'll be available there too. So it should be, it'll be out this summer one way or the other and uh, hopefully sooner than later and i'd be uh, uh, i'm really anxious to kind of get it done and then uh, take a break for a little bit i'm definitely looking forward to it so it's good to hear that it's not going to be too far from now so good luck with the final sprint i guess or the final push towards the end but i'm wondering you being you i'm sure you already have some ideas maybe what you want to do after this or maybe you already have lined up some things i'm just curious if you can share a little bit about your plans once you're done with that book yeah so uh once i'm done with this i'm going to take a break for a little bit um i need to just kind of rest up my fingers rest up my brain um, there are lots of things that happen after this. So this is actually based on courseware that I do. So I continue to offer this design class and build class uh, uh, as, as part of the program. So there's lots there. Uh, I'll probably be doing some uh, small videos on my YouTube channel that, that are features from the book. So there's, there's stuff to, to pick up along the way there. Just kind of give people a sense of what's going on. And then, like I say, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. I think uh, I have, you know, we've talked, I think we've talked about this before. I always have a couple of ideas percolating. I have a version of uh, a book about uh, interactive APIs on the web, sort of microservices on the web or RESTful microservices, an idea of how you can apply some of the same web theory to microservices in the open rather than inside an organization. Um, we'll see. That may be something I might work on in the next year or so. But right now, I just want to focus on getting this done, uh, sort of putting a bow on this, and then relax a little bit. That sounds like a good plan. And um, I, I think that once you're done with that book, you definitely have deserved a little rest. So I wanted to give you something, which of course I can't, but at least I brought it. So I have these ones that I got as a thank you gift for you. So these one are actually, it's not just beer. I mean, it is beer, but it's from Amundsen Brewing. So it's basically your, your family making these. It's from Oslo, Norway. So I'll hold on to these. And the next time we see each other, I make sure you get those beers. And I hope it's going to be, well, I don't know, later this year. I think this is, this is all we can say right now. But um, yeah, the Amundsen ones are waiting for you. And... Um, Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. I've actually been to the Amundsen Brewery in Oslo and they have a wonderful restaurant and pub right near the right near the water in downtown Oslo. It's a fantastic place and now I want one of those desperately. They have a great a great collection of beers. So now you want now I need I need to figure out how we're going to get together sometime soon, maybe in Oslo so we can enjoy one of those together. Yeah, so the ones that I have on offer here is one is a modern day IPA and the other one is a New England IPA. So those two, you'll definitely get the next time we meet. And yeah, let's try to meet in Oslo. That'd be cool. Uh, we'll see. Okay, so once again, thank you, Mike. It was really nice to talk to you and it was really good to hear about your book project. So I wish you all, you, all the best for the rest of this project. And until then, um, I guess we'll keep in touch and when the book is released, I'm sure we will all find out one way or the other. And um, thanks again. And thanks everybody for joining in. Bye.